And like if this situation wasn't already enough to make me feel pretty hopeless about this, there's even more drama to this whole thing that is unraveling beneath my feet. So I'm gonna pull up a chair here. Suggest you do the same thing because we're gonna have a little talk about what is going on behind the scenes of my issue and Ford's issue. Okay, so I still have not decided what I wanna do for replacement yet on the EcoBoost. I'll get to that part later in the video about what I'm thinking. The first part I wanna talk about is Ford and why I'm not alone in this. Even though it feels nice in a sense knowing I'm not alone, as in this isn't the only time this has ever happened to an EcoBoost engine, and the fact that I'm not the only person who is paying for a Ford vehicle having very unusual extensive problems, though it's nice knowing that I'm not the only one, it still doesn't fix the amount of mess this has created for me and how this affects other people. So it's, it's really, really upsetting um, to see what's going on. So I'm gonna talk about that right now. Just last night, actually, someone had commented on the most recent video and they had mentioned that there is a class action lawsuit filed against Ford. So the origin of this lawsuit actually goes back as far as 2020, but just recently in June of this year has this lawsuit taken the next step where attorneys are actually seeking more and more people to come through and get in contact with them over these issues they may have had with their vehicle. And this is basically going over the fact that Ford knew that they had a defective design allowing coolant to enter the middle two cylinders. All of that was caused by grooves that they had between the bores here to help coolant channel through and uh, allow a little bit of cooling, but that design was not good because what was happening is the gasket would not seal well around that groove and then coolant would get up into the gasket and puddle and then cause issues and cause the gasket to corrode, steam, all kinds of weird things that would allow the gasket to lift and then eventually coolant is dumping into your cylinders. While that hasn't been the specific issue for my engine, that is a big issue that has plagued many of the smaller EcoBoost four cylinders. While this class action lawsuit is only for those engines, we all know this is affected to two, three as well, because up until I think 2020 or 2019, uh, Ford also had those grooves in the two, three. So that's why a lot of two, three failures. As for what happened to mine, I'm still trying to figure that out, but uh, it seems to suffer from some type of coolant issue as well. It seems the failure of my engine is caused by a different problem than the standard EcoBoost. Then you're probably saying, well, the Focus RS had this issue when this engine came out. Yes, I know they did because Ford screwed up again and use the wrong gasket. That groove that goes between those bores has to have a very specific gasket. Since this doesn't have those grooves, the gasket has to be specific to allow coolant to pass up through and not have those holes in the gasket to allow coolant to go into that channel between the cylinders. That was the problem. It's because they used the gasket that was supposed to go on the blocks with those channels on a block that didn't have it, and that's what screwed that up. Now, my car has the correct gasket, yet somehow there was a sealing failure somewhere. I don't know if it's in the casting of the head or the block. God, I hope it's not the head. Um, that's gonna cause a real bad issue if that be the case. But somewhere along the way, there's coolant making its way somewhere. Uh, yeah. Anywho, with all of that out of the way, knowing that Ford has this big class action lawsuit now started against them over coolant issues on the EcoBoost engine, just a month later, Ford has been hit with another class action lawsuit. This one does affect me and my car. And honestly, this affects every 10-speed Mustang, any 10-speed vehicle. And it's because the class action lawsuit is against the fact that Ford has produced the 10 speed transmission with known defects and no changes to remedy the issue. And only recently have we seen Ford do some recalls on problems with the transmission. But the class action lawsuit states that Ford knew about the effective problems in the transmission. Same thing with the engine. They knew about it, they didn't want to take care of it. This affects all 10 speed vehicles. And basically the problem is internal component can fail and cause the transmission to just stop shifting. Uh, so that's a problem. And furthermore, I actually have proof of this issue. 
Uh, so the reason why I know about this lawsuit is because my sister, uh, whose boyfriend has a 2020 Lincoln Aviator, so a pretty well new vehicle, the same year as my Mustang, mind you, and he had it for a couple years now. He does a lot of driving for work, so he racked up a lot of miles really, really quick. A little over 70,000 miles on the vehicle. The vehicle's completely stock, serviced at the dealerships. With that out of the way, just recently they were out and about. They were on the highway. They were trying to pass another vehicle. When he put his foot down to pass, you know, obviously the transmission's gonna downshift to the right gear, and you know, you'll, you'll take off and do your thing. Well, that's not what happened. The transmission didn't shift at all. Instead, the RPMs did something weird, and then they said there was this loud clunk or bang noise. The whole car, I'm assuming, went into limit because they said it slowed down very rapidly. In traffic, they actually had to maneuver the vehicle across lanes very quickly because there was traffic, including semis, coming up behind them at full highway speed and they're slowing down because there's something went wrong with the vehicle. We got it onto the shoulder finally, thankfully without getting injured or you know in an accident. They said that they noticed this burning smell coming through the vents up under the vehicle that was coming from the transmission. Whatever had happened wasn't good and likely it was leaking transmission fluid, probably getting onto some hot components like the exhaust, which could have caused the fire, mind you. Trust me, I know a thing or two about car fires and it ain't fun when fluid gets on hot things. So that's really concerning that that happened and it happened at 70,000 miles. And what happened to their vehicle is the exact reason why there is this class action lawsuit now against Ford for the 10R80 transmission. Why am I even bringing this up? The fact that yes, my car does have that and the fact that my car is susceptible to that same exact scenario. The reason why I bring that up is because of now I am really worried about the car. If watching this engine that was taken very good care of just unexpectedly fail like this, didn't already lower my faith in this vehicle, having the transmission do the same thing is really gonna be a bad day. It's gonna be a bad day for both me and that car. Because if I go through all the trouble fixing this engine, we're talking minimum three plus thousand dollars to get just something back in the car, all the way up to possibly five plus thousand to get something nice. If I am spending this money on this car that I would not have wanted to spend, I really don't want to spend the money. And, and knowing that in another 20 to 30,000 miles, I could potentially be replacing the transmission out of warranty as well. So that's where I'm at with this. I fixed the car. Hopefully the replacement engine doesn't have issues. But then I am left with the fact knowing that I'm going to be spending similar money within the next few years on a transmission. So total, if, if that be the case, if I end up replacing both engine and transmission at the cost of about $10,000 combined within my ownership of this car, I may as well have just bought a GT Mustang from the start. Or, I mean, at that point, I could have bought a lot of other cars. If we're adding $10,000 more to the equation, that bumps you into a whole nother price bracket of other cars. And that's what upsets me. You know, that upsets me knowing that that is, you know, very well possible scenario for the future ownership of this car. And it's really unsettling. Not to mention that I chose the EcoBoost Mustang to save myself money over other versions of the Mustang just to end up spending more money in the end fixing the EcoBoost Mustang because everything broke. Oh, the irony in that. Obviously, I said I'll wait until later in the video to explain what I'm doing as options on things, and that's this part of the video. So obviously, um, you know, I have a few options. I can get a built short block from multiple companies with varying degrees of power levels and what they can handle and upgrades done. Most of the short blocks available are based off a 2.0 block, which is nice because you don't have to deal with the open deck like this. So obviously that's a lot stronger. Um, and most of the engines, I know that out of the box, I have to, I have to look around a little bit more, but I know most of them out of the box can easily handle four or 500 wheel horsepower, which honestly, my goal for this car was 500 wheel daily and the turbo can support that at its very limit. So, you know, I have all the components to make that work. Do I wanna do that? I don't know, because I still would need to upgrade the fueling system and all that to do it correctly. 
and it's much more money spent to do it, but beyond the point, just to get an engine back in the car, I can go that route, built short block. Now, furthermore, there is a possibility that this block is salvageable. While the cylinder bore is completely screwed and mangled and no amount of boring out will really be beneficial because I'll have to take way too much material out. You can kind of do both and retain rigidity of each cylinder by using cylinder sleeves. Now there is a set of sleeves that you can get or liners that you can have installed in these engines. The liners themselves are $750. So $750 is a lot just for these, these liners. Um, and then you can easily be looking at $200 or more per cylinder to put them in. So then you have two, four, six, eight hundred more dollars in the install, the machine work, and then another seven hundred. So it just round up the eight with taxes and everything. So sixteen hundred dollars just to reline all these cylinders. That's a possibility, assuming that there are is no further damage in this block. But at that point, like I said, I'm going to be spending sixteen hundred dollars just to repair this part. Probably another four hundred dollars and machine work elsewhere, getting it all cleaned and up and whatnot. So all said and done, we're gonna be looking at $2,200 just to repair the existing RS block. Then once I have the block repaired, I'm still going to need pistons and rods, assuming that the crank is not damaged. You know, pistons and rods can vary. You know, you can get under a thousand or you can be over a thousand or over 2000, depending on what you are doing. The pistons I would love to use because it just makes sense to me is about $1,400. So $1,400 on top of $2,200, now we're at $3,600 to be back to a short block, which is still cheaper than your aftermarket block. But with that, I have the risk knowing that there's other problems with this block that I may not know about. So really, for not much more money, I get a built short block that I know is rated for a lot of power, the power that I'm looking to be making. It definitely seems to make sense to go that route. Now, the other third option I have is there are some factory short blocks on like eBay and such that you can see that are actually not a bad deal. Um, there's one right now I'm eyeing up that is a factory short block 2.3 for the Ford Ranger. But it's the same thing. Actually, I think the only difference is the oil pan which I have the oil pan, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, but aside from that, there is no difference. Obviously, it's using a little bit weaker components than what you get with the RS. So overall, I would be limited to the reliable power I can put on that engine block, and I wouldn't be able to make really any more power than what the car is making now without worrying about something happening. I can have that engine shipped to my door for about $1,700. The whole engine basically back together for less than $3,000 if going with that factory short block, which financially would be the best. Like that would save me a lot of extra money and any additional money I have from the sale of the Fiero, I can put to the side towards another project car or whatever, you know? So there's that. With a built short block, depending on who I get it from, which I am still trying to figure that out, now I'm basically between a built short block from MA Performance and EMS. I started considering MA Performance because, you know, they seem to have these things ready to go, ready to ship out, and they ship really quick, you know, eight to 14 days or 10 to 14 days, maybe that's what it was, to have a, one shipped out, which is really good. And shipping is included in their price. Right now, they seem to have a little deal going on them for $4,200. I think it's a little bit more because they have to use a special engine mount or something for the Mustang. So it's like, 4274 something for their built short block, which I'm not sure how much it handles, but I would assume at least the power I'm looking to make 500 wheels. It's got all the good stuff in it. Forge H-beam rods, forge pistons, factory crank, touched up 2 block, you know, all the, all the nice things. Their short block would definitely meet my needs. For the longest time, I was always like under the impression that EMS is the best and EMS makes this and they have the world record breaking EcoBoost, even though it isn't remotely near a streetable car, at least the engine is still in one piece. Whether they're record breaking EcoBoost could never be driven on the street. The fact that they have the knowledge to get to that point you know, then that should all come down to good street engines, right? 
Well, for the most part, yes, I think that would be true. However, some people have said that they've heard mixed things about EMS. I don't know. I haven't heard mixed things. Mostly I hear is good things, but that's also bit me in the butt a couple times before with some previous tuners I went with for my SHO. So, you know, I don't know how that goes really. Now the problem with EMS is not only is theirs slightly more expensive than MA Performance, they also I think have a longer time to get one sent out and I'm not sure if they charge shipping or not in their price. Nothing said free shipping, but like I went to check out and everything and it didn't say anything about shipping charges. So I'm not sure if they charge shipping or not, but their engine is supposedly also rated, you know, up to 700 horsepower or whatever, which I will never see on that turbo, on, on this fuel system. And from that matter, even that head, you'll never see 700 horsepower. So it would definitely be overbuilt which would be great in a sense, because at that point, theoretically, it should be more reliable. Now, here's the problem I personally have with EMS. Just recently, I tried to reach out to them through a few different contacts I have on Facebook that are reps of the company. I have not received anything back. I even messaged their Facebook page directly just to have the message read and ignored. So I'm not sure what's going on there, though I have not made any efforts to email or call them. I was just looking for some basic information some guidance maybe, and some information about their short block. Kind of unsettling knowing that even through a simple form of contact such as Facebook Messenger, I haven't been able to get a hold of anyone. What if I have a problem when I do spend thousands of dollars on one of their products? Is this going to be a problem with getting a hold of someone? You know, that really does bug me knowing that that could be a possibility. Which is why I'm more or less leaning towards MA Performance, uh, possibly better customer service, very similar quality product, cheaper, fast for Free shipping and yeah I don't know I mean that's what I'm currently thinking that's kind of where I'm going with this I'll be able to get more reliable power out of it make some better content and that's kind of where I'm going with this <laughs> though trust me I crunched the numbers and with the current amount of views I get per video I will never recoup the cost of this <laughs> of this uh, engine build. Unless I get another viral video of doing something stupid. Whatever, that's a, that's a problem for another day, I guess. But yeah, that's where I'm at with this. Let me know what you think through your comments down below. And I think that's gonna wrap it up here for this video. If you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up. Share it with everyone you know. If you wanna see more content like this and you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Keep a lookout for the next Cars Creative video.